is that there are two really good scientific experiments, yes. double blind, all that stuff, that show that everybody has precognitive powers. As far as I'm aware, it's depending on how you de describe it. There's two, uh, there's two alternative solutions. Either we have precognitive abilities, and as a writer turned around and said, after the Beerman and Radin experiment took place, somebody said, this is rather like we all have the precog abilities from the movie, Vanilla, from the movie Minority Report that we all have short-term precognitive abilities. The counter-argument is that what happens is the brain effectively buffers everything. In other words, you've got all these signals coming in, and it buffers it till it's got all the information. Then it presents it to consciousness, mm. which would explain the delay. So in which case, that doesn't mean precognition. But what it means, even more interestingly, is that we all exist slightly behind time. So all of us are existing about 0.5 of a second but towards reality. Could that explain why you jump before you hear a bang? Yeah, but you can't, even if there is a buffering process in your brain, it wouldn't explain how you think the light's going to turn green before it turns green. Well, it w no, it wouldn't, unless subconsciously you knew. And well, then the only way you can subconsciously know is if you were precognitive. Sure, if you're precognitive, yeah. <laughs> let, me, no let me read this question. This is from Paul in Warrington. Why does hypnosis alter the brain's interpretation of self and who you are? This, again, is something I deal with in the Daemon. I touch upon it in the first book, and I deal... In fact, there is a much more hard scientific version of my first book where I deal with hypnotism in great detail. What I argue is, is that in deep hypnotic states, you can... And we haven't really discussed this so far, but I have an idea... Uh, uh, my hypothesis suggests that at the point of death, we split into two personalities. The Edelon, which is our everyday self, the being that calls itself I, and the Daemon, which is a being that remembers you're living your life before. The, de the being that lives your life before is totally precognitive, knows everything that's going to happen in your life, and this being exists in your deep subconscious brain, probably in your non-dominant hemisphere. That being is the being we encounter when you go into deep hypnotic trances. I have people who do this for a living, and they've come back to me and they've said, this explains what do we've been doing. Do hypnosis, you mean? They do what? hypnosis, mm -hmm. hypnotherapists and things. And they've all come, or many of them have come back to me and said, this explains it because I keep encountering another person when I deep hypnotize people. This would explain multiple personality syndrome or multiple personality Sure, you'd only have two, though, wouldn't you? You do, ultimately. That's the interesting thing. If you go into the cases, what you will always find, I mean, the real classic cases, such as the Billy Milligan case, the Sybil case, uh, and the Eve cases, and indeed the cases by Pierre Janet in the 19th century, what these people do when they work with these individuals is they find the, multi the, 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 the other personality within the multiple personalities that they usually call the teacher. When they find that being, that being is then in a position to amalgamate the fractionalized personalities into just the everyday personality, which is the Edelon and the Daemon, and then they're cured. So the Edelon is like the, everybody, is like the, the person inside everybody that says, I'm, I'm me. me. I'm me. Right, and it's, the, the Daemon, we're, we're going to get into the split brain thing in the, yeah. in the next section, I think. Let me just read you one, um, one here, uh, which I thought was quite good. Um, Carol from Wakefield says, in hypnotherapy, it's known that the subconscious mind is the all-knowing mind. You could call it the mind of God. Okay. Ask and it is given. Yeah, it's the daemon. This, this exactly, we're just using different <clears throat> terminology. You're saying that it's all-knowing as well. Oh, it's all-knowing. It is all-knowing and effectively it <clears throat> is possible that the daemon has access to, to greater information because it may have access to the Akashic Record and various other things which we were discussing before. But the idea is that the daemon knows everything. So if a daemon, about your life. it's possible, isn't it, that a daemon could then say, uh, no, I don't know, the locomotive style of a certain kind of dinosaur. That's a now, I would, I if that would was already the Akashic record. It's a, it's a good thing, that one, an interesting point. I would, uh, from, my th from my hypothesis, I don't go as far as many people in terms of this, but other people that are involved in my forum have done so. I argue that as far as I'm concerned, at the evidence I have from the, 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 the work I've done is that it seems that Damon only knows the things that you will learn in your life and in your future. It won't know anything that you won't encounter in your life. However, and we need to come on to this, is something called the many worlds interpretation, which suggests that you can live every possible life that is possible for you to live. And it's important we come into that point later, because a lot of people out there will be confused about this. But effectively, every possible life you can live. So I argue that when you're living your life again in the Bohemian IMAX, it's rather like you're driving a car. You're the driver of the car, and the daemon is your passenger. 
the daemon knows where the road's going to go. And the, you're driving along, and the daemon will go, bloody hell, I remember last time there was a crash here. I want, I want my Edelon to turn off the road. So it either nudges you mm -hmm. and gives you a hunch, or it shouts at you and says, move, or whatever. But it makes you move. So it turns you off the road into a new road, mm -hmm. which avoids your death, avoids the accident. I have so much evidence in the daemon from my readers of people who've emailed me from around the world who've had normal people who've had the most amazing events that have saved their lives. And it's because the daemon warns them. But you then go off into another life. You then mm. go off into another universe. Another universe that's been recorded by another version of you within the Many Worlds interpretation. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so, so, I mean, maybe we should start talking about the, um, the brain itself. Yep. Well, what is fascinating, if, and it is something that neurologists and physiologists have been fascinated by since they first looked at brains, as to why brains have two hemispheres. It seems totally a redundancy. Um, I don't know if, if many of the people out there are aware, but I know that the, the neurologists and the, the physiologists will know this. But if you look at the brain itself, we have two brains, and it's not just the cerebral cortex, but even all the little, the, the, the reticular formation, all the little bits and pieces that are underneath, are mirror imaged. We have two amygdalas, we have two hippocampi. Everything is, is doubled, with the exception of something called a pineal gland. And the brainstem is? Uh, the bra well, the brainstem isn't really, well, the brainstem, we argued, is the reptilian brain, I suppose, that sits underneath. But the, the upper brain, for want mm. of a better term, sits like that. If you split it open, you'll find that everything is reproduced, with the exception of the pineal gland. And that's why a lot of people think the pineal gland is the third eye, the ossified third eye. And there is, a, there is a lot of work being done on this about the DMT molecule, which I mentioned earlier, a guy called Rick Strassman. But anyway, so the two parts of the brain are held together by something called a corpus callosum. Now, for many, many years, neurologists didn't know why it was what the, neuro, the corpus callosum was until in the 1950s they did something called a coma tumori, I think is pronounced, whereby they used to cut the corpus callosum of people who had profound epilepsy. The idea being that by doing so you'd stop the epilepsy crossing the two hemispheres. Which is like a sort of firestorm in yeah, the brain. Yeah, imagine it's like a firestorm that storms in one point, the focal point of the epilepsy, the focal point, and it storms out and it crosses the corpus callosum and when it joins both sides of the brain it causes unconsciousness. But if you sever it you can stop people losing consciousness. And this is what they used to do. But when they started doing this work, people like Roger Sperry and Michael Gazanaga and people like that, they suddenly discovered that instead of having one personality in the head, we had two. And suddenly these split brain patients were suddenly two people. And it was something that completely stunned everybody because this is not what they were expecting. But the difficulty is the non-dominant hemisphere Ordinarily, in, mo in all, I think I'm right in saying, in all right-handed people, it's your, yeah, in all right-handed people, it's your right hemisphere. So this is the dominant hemisphere, Domin the, the non-dominant hemisphere. Yeah, your left, if you are right-handed, your dominant hemisphere is your right hemisphere. Because the brain switches over, in other That's words. It's the other way around, isn't it, surely? Yes, we left, sorry, left, and yeah, sorry, left, you're right. Left is dominant for right, and right is dominant yeah. for left, that's right. So, what they found is that the non-dominant hemisphere d has certain things it can't do. It can't speak normally, because there's something called Broca's area, which was processes speech, and it's normally found as part of the cerebral hemisphere. This is when they're doing MRI scanning. They can work out from what your brain is, is doing now. Yes, can't they you? Can. When, you're, when you're doing things, they can look at where the activity is yeah. in your brain, with and they'll magnetic know resonance. And in they it. know what's happening yeah. uh, in terms of where that, why that starts there in any ways. But the thing is that what they found was that there were certain individuals that they could, they could communicate with the non-dominant hemisphere. And in doing so, they found that the, the non-dominant hemisphere had totally different worldview and objectives. A classic case was somebody called P.S., who was a young man who had a split brain, and they were talking to him one day, and they were asking what he wanted to be in the future. And he said he'd like to be a racing driver. As he said he wanted to be a racing driver, his left hand picked up a group of Scrabble cards on the table and grabbed them like this and put down automobile... No, he wanted to be a draftsman, that's right. Draftsman, yeah. And the, the other hand turned around and said he wanted to be an automobile racer. So clearly, as somebody once said, it's what it must be like to be the non-dominant hemisphere. You've been overruled all your life. But effectively, I argue that on a deeper level, that hemisphere is where the daemon exists 
And the daemon doesn't want to communicate because it knows too much and it doesn't want to communicate that necessarily. Oh, but, but surely in early stages of lives, you're saying that it doesn't actually know it's there. It doesn't. Huh? At the point of death, this is again one of the things I deal oh. with. We're going to go for another break now. Uh, once again, if you'd like to text in your comments to 8778, please do so now. See you very soon.